This is the Monday, May 16th, 2016 episode of the History Author Show. Visit our iHeartRadio channel or subscribe on iTunes to enjoy a brand new interview every Monday morning, as well as Classical Wisdom Wednesdays and History in Five Fridays. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old towns of mine. The sawdust is gone from the floor. Where we harmonize, sweet Adeline. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis, and this is the History Author Show on iHeartRadio. Today, our time machine is dropping us off in the extremely cold winter of December 1892 at Chicago's Columbian Exposition, a forerunner of the 20th century's World's Fairs. Our guide on this journey is Betsy Harvey Kraft. She's the author of several nonfiction books for young readers including Theodore Roosevelt, Champion of the American Spirit. Today, she's sharing her latest work, The Fantastic Ferris Wheel, the story of inventor George Ferris. It's written for children five to nine years of age, but it's fun, as the saying goes, for children of all ages. And I guarantee, with a big Memorial Day weekend and summer just around the corner from when we're airing this episode, you will never look at a Ferris wheel the same way after reading Betsy's book, those with an eye for art will find the fantastic Ferris wheel beautifully illustrated by Stephen Salerno. You can see some of the over 20 books he's brought to life by visiting his website, stephensalerno.com. And that's Stephen with a V. Okay, now that we've purchased our ticket and gotten in line, let's travel back to the Columbian Exposition and soar 26 stories over Chicago on the Fantastic Ferris Wheel. I'm joined on the line by Betsy Harvey Kraft, author of The Fantastic Ferris Wheel, the story of inventor George Ferris. Thank you for making time to talk with the History Author Show today. Well, I'm delighted to be here. People tend to assume that writing books for kids is easy. I would bet you hear that a lot. Oh, that that's so easy because it's just kids that are reading it. But <laughs> We know better, of course. So let's start off by debunking that myth. What's involved with producing a really engaging book like The Fantastic Ferris Wheel? Well, if writing books for kids is easy, I'm not one of those authors. It took me two and a half years to write what finally became the final version of The Fantastic Ferris Wheel. My first draft was about 50 pages long. And I'd included everything I knew about George Ferris, the World's Fair, the way people lived back then, the competition with Eiffel Tower in Paris, everything. And I did it in detail. The result was quite wordy, but it wasn't long enough to be a young adult book, which was what I was used to writing. And then I thought about the material I had, and I thought how great it would be to do it as a picture book. So I cut a lot of words out from the manuscript and I had to keep writing, rewriting. I hadn't written for really young kids before and it was definitely a learning process. When you're writing a picture book, you really have to drill down to the most important events and the most important personalities to tell the story. And you have to decide how to frame the story so that it moves along to a logical conclusion. Then you have to consider word choice. I try to use a variety of words, but you have to be careful of what words a young kid might not know. But I also like to include a word or two that stretches them a little bit. For instance, in this book, the world's fairgrounds was landscaped, and I included lagoons for boating. And most young kids don't know what a lagoon is. So I wrote, there were plans for beautiful parks and small lakes called lagoons with boats for tourists. And that way I try and incorporate the meaning of the word in the sentence. And then there's the illustrations. And I knew that the publisher would choose an artist who would add terrific visual element to this. 
when it was finished. So I was aware that the illustrator would add lots of excitement and details that I couldn't even imagine. So that's a long way of saying writing children's books is not easy, for me at least. <laughs> There's a lot of research involved and you learn a lot, but it's also a lot of fun. Yeah, and as you were saying that and talking about this period in the Gilded Age, I thought of the quote credited to Mark Twain where he writes a friend and says, sorry, I would have written a short letter, but I didn't have yes. time, so I wrote a long <laughs> one. Like People, I'm sure, look at this and say, gosh, yeah, but it's kind of like looking at you know, Michelangelo's David. That's an author that I interviewed, Miles Unger, and he talked about it in the stone. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's like looking at that and saying, well, that's not much stone. Mm -hmm. But yeah, he had to start with <laughs> a big, giant granite quarry to find the right piece for starters. So it's really about what you leave on like a haircut. One of my sister-in-laws is a cosmetologist and she would cut hair and she'd say, it matters what you leave on, not what you take off. Nobody ever asks how much you cut uh, off. That's right? interesting. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's kind of the same thing. Uh -huh. Now, since our listeners, the ones with the power of the purse are adults, I want you to take a minute to make your pitch for why The Fantastic Ferris Wheel is a great book for kids, why you wrote it and what your reactions you've been getting. Who was this George Ferris? This was his real name, by the way. And why is his story important to share with young readers? Well, I don't really have a, an elevator speech for that. You know, a lot of people say you should have a three-minute pitch or a two-minute pitch to pitch your books. But there's so much in this book that I tend to go on a little bit, but George Ferris was an engineer of a really astounding vision. And at the first of the book, when I introduce him, he's a young boy and he's living on a ranch in Nevada. And I show him as a bit of a dreamer at the beginning. But when next we see him, he's an adult and a very accomplished engineer. And then I move the story on to planning for the 1893 World's Fair in Chicago. And that's when we meet another major character, and that's Daniel Burnham. And it was Burnham who was in charge of the fair. I mean, he was in charge of everything. He oversaw the construction of the temporary buildings that made up the fairgrounds. He supervised the work of landscapers. He was in charge of the programs and the events. But he still kept longing for something that would be very special for the fair. And he wanted something that would rival the Eiffel Tower that France had built for their World's Fair several years before. So for inspiration, he turned to the engineers of the United States, and he met with them, and he said he wanted something unique and entertaining, and he wanted something that nobody had ever seen before. And that's when he made his famous quote, make no little plans, they have no magic to stir men's blood, think big. And that's when George Ferris comes back into the story. He was inspired by Burnham's call and almost immediately came up with his idea for the observation wheel, which is what he called, what we now call a Ferris wheel. And according to Ferris, he drew the complete plans for the wheel while he was sitting at dinner with some other engineers. And he never changed anything in the plans from that first vision that he had. I mean, that is really amazing. I mean, he had everything thought out. He knew where every bolt was going to be. He knew how the engines would power the wheel. And so that, to me, is one of the most amazing things. First, it was the concept itself. And there had been small observation wheels before, but they were mostly made of wood, and they carried very few people, maybe 30, 20 people. But Ferris's wheel was made out of steel, and it would rise 264 feet into the air, and it would carry more than 2,000 people, and those people would be riding in 36 passenger cars. And each of those passenger cars was as big as a bus or a railroad car. But, of course, he had one problem when he showed the plans for the wheel to Burnham and the others in charge of the fair. They rejected it, and they thought, oh, yes, this is really unique, but they thought it was way too dangerous. And, you know, what would happen if it didn't work properly? What if a heavy wind blew it down with 2,000 people on it? So he went back, and he thought some more, and he decided he was going to approach them again. So he went back to the fair and presented his plans again, and they turned him down again. 
so two strikes. But after he sort of arranged for funding for the observation wheel, which he really developed and got a lot of heavy rollers to support it. And so that obviously interested the fair people too. So they said they accepted his idea finally. They were still dubious, but they accepted it. And the problem was that by the time they accepted his proposal, it was four and a half months until the fair was supposed to open. Mm. So he had this Herculean task of finishing the wheel in time for the fair. And it was during one of the worst winters that Chicago had ever had. And so the working conditions were really, really quite daunting. He didn't make it for the deadline for the opening of the fair, which was in May, but he did complete it in June. And then, of course, it went on to be the most popular event at the fair, and thousands of people wrote it. And I think that Ferris is a real visionary. He had complete confidence. He had confidence in his professional skills and also for the plan for the wheel. He was a trained engineer, and he had built roads and bridges before, so he was used to the risks that go with doing large construction projects. But he also had the imagination to think big, like Burnham had suggested. And he was convinced enough of his skills that he didn't get discouraged when he was rejected two times. And uh, he kept trying. And so then today, the fact that all these wheels are named the Ferris wheel tells us something about what a major breakthrough this was. As you're speaking about them being reluctant to put up this giant steel wheel, Mm -hmm. I'm thinking even today people are reluctant to get on Ferris wheels. (laughs) So can you imagine when this is, okay, I'm going to build this giant wheel Mm -hmm. and at a time when skyscrapers are very new in the period that we're talking about here, 1892, I mean, there's not many high skyscrapers, right? So why would a person that lives in the Gilded Age in their mind have to have an elevator pitch? The (laughs) Eiffel Tower was the tallest building, (laughs) right? So. Yeah, you don't need that. You The elevator chips simply weren't that long back then. Mm-hmm. So we're not talking windows on the world here. We're talking, you know, quick hop up to the top of the observation deck and back down. Yeah. So that's one of the things. The Paris World's Fair, by the way, 1889, so mm-hmm. a couple of years here before Ferris gets this inspiration or gets this bug in his ear about this to create this amazing wheel for the World's Fair home in Chicago. Mm-hmm. I love the idea of the World's Fair, and there's a quote about them. It's about the 1901 Pan American Exposition in Buffalo. Right. Your book reminded me of something President William McKinley said when he visited there. Quote, expositions are the timekeepers of progress. They record the world's advancement. They stimulate the energy, enterprise, and intellect of the people and quicken human genius. They go into the home. They broaden and brighten the daily lives of people. They open mighty storehouses of information to the student, unquote. He could have been talking about this story that you tell here, and it's really that sense of adventure that I think we've lost in modern life. We're used to a new, modern, exciting spectacle every day just on our phones, never mind going, traveling hundreds of miles to see one. So that really could have been the spirit here of the Chicago Fair, couldn't it? Yes, and that's a really good analogy that it probably wouldn't happen today. I can't imagine they will have another World's Fair, but it probably won't represent such a dramatic change in society because the Chicago's World's Fair represented a time when America was becoming quite industrialized and the opening of the Transcontinental Railroad changed transportation in America very, very dramatically. Cities were burgeoning, and Burnham especially was involved in the idea that cities should be made beautiful by good planning and landscaping and architecture. And that was a theme that was really with him all his life. So that was a new concept because people really hadn't given much thought to how cities develop. Along with the transportation, there were lots of exhibits of boats from various countries and also of bicycles. Bicycles were a huge mode of transportation then. Now, the automobile as we know it today really didn't come in until a little bit later. But probably the most important invention that was shown at the fair was that of electricity. 
and this was the first use of alternating current, big use of alternating current up till that time. And the walkways at the fair and the buildings at the fair were all lighted up with incandescent bulbs. And then the rims of the Ferris wheel were decorated with little electric lights, and that created a wonderful spectacle as the wheels rotated at night. I mean, it was really magical. And the fair also showcased many new gadgets that we take for granted today. There was the telephone, electric dishwashers and stoves. There was even a hand crank gramophone, which was the beginning of making recorded music accessible to the world. So there was a lot going on, and there were also ideas. They had a lot of lectures at the fair, and people were talking about things that they hadn't talked before, especially women's rights, the idea of the women voting and everything. So that was new, too. It occurs to me also that we have places like Epcot Center now Mm -hmm. that are just sort of a World's Fair fixed in time. Today, it's sort of a joke almost about how a lot of that stuff is stuck in the 80s, right? What people in 1982 thought the future would look like. (laughs) But also we have movies and sci-fi and we have this grand vision. As Buzz Aldrin was on the cover of a magazine, I can't remember the magazine, but Uh the caption was, you promised me Mars colonies, instead I got Facebook. (laughs) So I I think we're... (laughs) That's a great quote. (laughs) Yeah, we're kind of cynical about the future and what Mm -hmm. it has brought to us. Mm -hmm. But So when you talk about an engineer like John Roebling, who designed the Brooklyn Bridge, or George Washington and Gail Ferris, they really were visionaries in a way that I think we forget. There's no computer here. There's no way for him to run simulations. He really has to just overcome these challenges and go forward. One of the things in the book that I notice is he always looks so serious, if not dour. Is it, what kind of a man was he? I don't think he was irritated because he had <laughs> tre- tremendous confidence in himself and in the plan that he had drawn at dinner one time. Obviously, he had been thinking about this before. But, you know, the scale of the wheel was just overwhelming, and it, it would be even today. Some people were really excited about it, and others were terrified at the thought. It went 264 feet up into the air, and that was as high as a 26-story building. I think it was slightly higher than the highest building in Chicago at that time. And it was higher than the Statue of Liberty out in New York. It was not as tall as the Eiffel Tower in Paris, but... The attraction was that this contraption actually moved and people could ride on it and interact with it. So it really was unique. And he needed more than, what, 100,000 different parts to build this wheel. And it was an enormously complicated endeavor. And one of the things that amazed me was that Ferris had all this complete confidence in the plans he had drawn for the wheel. And as a matter of fact, he spent much of his time in his office in Pittsburgh and left much of the advisory work on on the construction to his engineering associates out in Chicago. So when you ask if he was dour and serious, I think he probably was. There are no stories about him popping champagne and anything. His wife at the time (laughs) was much more publicist and much more lively. And she rode up in the Ferris wheel the first time it went round. But he was a serious guy. We would probably call him a dork today. (laughs) (laughs) Well, And by the way, no airplane, something to remind your kids when they pick up the fantastic Ferris wheel. So this would be not only the highest you'd ever been and probably anybody you knew that wasn't on the wheel had been in their life, but this would be the highest you would ever be in your life for a lot of people. There was balloons, oh, yeah. but this would have been just so amazing to have that view. And you never even would have seen a picture from that high up. I mean, this is an amazing leap forward in technology for people. And it's too bad we don't have that sense of wonder maybe anymore about a lot of things. So this would just have been an incredible experience for people to go up there. It really was. My guest is Betsy Harvey Craft, and her book for young readers is The Fantastic Ferris Wheel, the story of inventor George Ferris, with illustrations by Stephen Salerno, by the way, who we'll talk about in a minute. Publishers Weekly says of the book, quote, Salerno's precisely drafted illustrations give a solid sense of the era 
including intricate renderings of Chicago architecture and the construction of the wheel, while Kraft creates a genuine suspense in the lead-up to its debut, unquote. I chose that part of their review because in the fantastic Ferris wheel, you had to spin this yarn with an illustrator. So how did that collaboration play out? Well, <laughs> that's interesting. One of the little-known facts about publishing picture books is that often the author of the text and the artist of the illustrations don't even meet. The publisher chooses both the author and the illustrator. And they really don't communicate with each other directly. Now, I was tremendously pleased with Steve Salerno's pictures, but I didn't even see them until they were in rough draft. And then I saw them when they were in more finished form. But he did so much research on his own that he really didn't need any input from me. It turned out to be a nice marriage of text and art, I thought. He has real attention to detail, and I went over a lot of these pictures very closely. The mustaches, the clothes. Oh, yeah. In one illustration, Stephen has Daniel Burnham, who <laughs> you spoke about, one of the men planning the exposition, and he's holding a small American flag, and I automatically counted the stars. And <laughs> sure enough, 44 stars, exactly the right number for the 44 states at that time. Yeah. His illustration could speak to you. He has a, a bunch of them on his website, mm -hmm. stephensalerno.com, and looks like real historical people. He didn't just yeah. throw any old head on there like you see sometimes in books. Yeah, he's not only an illustrator, he's a researcher. Clearly, because you can see that he has just the right things there, the little watch pocket, things that, again, this is not easy work just because it's for children. You don't throw an airplane in the sky. You, know? <laughs> right. you don't want anachronisms in there. You want it to be teaching, but also fun and accurate. Yeah. And you also included in the book a large foldout of the Eye of London, the Ferris wheel of people today are probably very familiar with from seeing it at the Olympics. Mm -hmm. George Ferris's legacy is all around us. And I wondered, of this really widespread legacy, what part of it first inspired you to track down the origin story? Well, it's hard to really nail down the exact thing that made me uh, want to do it. But w when I get an idea for a book, it usually just starts as sort of an awareness of something that I think is interesting. And it's back there in the back of my mind. And then as I go ahead and read various books, see public television documentaries, I start picking up little hints about what else was involved in the Ferris wheel. And like a lot of young people, I knew Ferris wheels from my childhood. You know, I rode them at carnivals and at our state fair. But the funny thing is, I was always terrified of them, and I still am. And when I was working on this book, I actually had to force myself to ride the Ferris wheel at Navy Pier in Chicago. And that wheel is only half the size of the one at the 1893 fair. And I've not gotten to ride the London Eye, but I'm sure I'd be nervous with that one yeah. too. But things kind of coalesce, and books and films and just talking to people. Everybody has a story, and they usually know something about what it is you're writing about. Speaking of that terror of stepping on a Ferris wheel, mm -hmm. even though today the technology is obviously, what, up to 120 years old, mm -hmm. picture being on the Ferris wheel there when it's this brand new construction and people are fearing that it might fall down already, and a funnel cloud forms with mm -hmm. 115 miles an hour winds at the exposition. Yep. Again, this is beautifully drawn. Tell us about that moment. Well, it really was a very dramatic event at the fair. It caused a lot of damage to a lot of the buildings and some of the boats. There was broken glass. But what everybody had worried about was the Ferris wheel, what would happen to it in a very high wind. And uh, it just kept circling without a hitch. I mean, it was just steady as a rock. And George Ferris and his wife happened to be on board when the storm took place. He must have really felt a sense of validation of his idea because there had been so much doubt about whether or not it would work, whether or not it would be safe. And he was glad to be aboard during the storm, I think. 
Yes, you say it in the book that he hurried to the wheel. He was going to make sure, and he's on there. Yeah. Just a fantastic illustration by Stephen Salerno, and I laughed when I saw it, and people will get the book because I can't do it justice, but <laughs> there he is, and he's slightly different color. He's slightly brown. The other people are gray. They're all looking terrified, these mm -hmm. men and women, mm -hmm. terrified expressions. One little girl who he very nicely draws very subtly is she looks concerned, but she's not scared, which is good for children. You don't want it to be too terrifying. There's Mrs. Ferris. She's holding onto his arm and he has his arms crossed and he's got that scowl that we talked mm -hmm, about. It's mm -hmm. just such a wonderful moment where you see him. He's not worried. He's <laughs> a little irritated. Anyone would question it. Yes, they they exactly. think it would go down. <laughs> it's like, this is just something I'm going to just stand here. And mm -hmm. that must have been a great comfort, too, to people mm -hmm. that were on there at the time to see him just take to it. So yeah. this is a way that definitely your prose and his art work together so well in this book. And I wanted to mention one last thing. In the introduction, I spoke about Theodore Roosevelt, Champion of the American Spirit, another mm -hmm. book that you wrote. T.R. also visited the exposition, although mm -hmm. there's no record of him riding the Ferris wheel. So as we wrap up, a final question about that. What part of that Gilded Age spirit of Theodore Roosevelt's and George Ferris's do you think young people can incorporate as they face 21st century challenges? Well, T.R., of course, was he was one of a kind, and he was tremendously interested in everything. He was tremendously self-confident, and he had enormous optimism for the future. I mean, he had all these ideas, not just one idea, but Ferris also had that confidence, his confidence in his work. I don't know if he was thinking of this as a great venture into the future or not, but he just saw it as a fascinating engineering project. And they both saw things as possible, and they both undertook risks and responsibilities. And they became experts in their field. You know, Ferris was a, a, a very accomplished engineer, and of course, <laughs> TR was accomplished in many different fields. So they had the perseverance to try out their new ideas in the world. And, you know, it's an exciting time now, really, even though we don't have that same optimism that you talked about. And young inventors today, they have the same opportunities to learn their craft really well and envision a new world. And there are tremendous opportunities for inventors today, you know, in and certainly in medical equipment, transportation, and the environment. There are a lot of interesting work going on in the environment. And Burnham was actually kind of one of the first environmentalists, and he thought we were going to ruin the planet. And he thought the automobile was a wonderful, wonderful invention because it would get rid of all the waste the horses left on the street. Um, but, of course, that hasn't actually turned out to be the case. But anyway, who knows what today's young inventors will surprise us with. Well, Winston Churchill said the empires of the future are the empires of the mind. So ah. this is a great way to feed young minds and help them also. We all have fears when we're older. You and I were talking about the Ferris wheel. I will confess they make me nervous, too, to be up that high. But Theodore Roosevelt said he would act as if he wasn't afraid, and he found that eventually he would really not be afraid. Exactly. These are all great lessons. Mm -hmm. Betsy Harvey Craft, the back cover of the fantastic Ferris wheel, bears that quote, make big plans. George Ferris certainly did. I hope listeners will make a plan to pick up your book, and I thank you for writing it. I thank Stephen Salerno for drawing it, and I'm sure it will be an inspiration to the next generation of inventors. Well, thank you very much. I've enjoyed talking about the book. Well, best of luck with it. It really was enjoyable, even for somebody who's way past the age group. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, you can still ride a Ferris wheel. <laughs> <laughs> Again, the book is The Fantastic Ferris Wheel, the story of inventor George Ferris. As always, you can find the Amazon link to purchase your copy at historyauthor.com. And we hope you will click through there, or even bookmark the URL from the Amazon banner on our homepage for all your online purchases. Amazon.com gives us a small percentage of every purchase you make through that URL at no additional cost to you. Once again, my thanks to Betsy Harvey Kraft for joining us and for sharing the inspiring story of inventor George Ferris. 
Please remember to visit stevensalerno.com as well, and check out the illustrator who brings this tale of Chicago's 1893 Columbian Exposition to life for young readers. And remember, let us know what you think of the book and the interview on Twitter at History Dean or at Facebook.com slash History Author. Visit stevensalerno.com as well, and check out the illustrator who brings this tale of Chicago's 1893 Columbian Exposition to life for young readers. And remember, let us know what you think of the book and the interview on Twitter at History Dean or at Facebook.com slash History Author. Well, that's it for this installment of the History Author Show. I hope you'll join us for Classical Wisdom Wednesday, History in Five Friday, and next Monday's all-new interview. And remember, if you subscribe to us on iTunes, please take a minute to leave us a review. Thanks for time traveling into the past with us today, and happy reading. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore.